Hello, everyone. Uh, nice uh, lunch in California. Uh, lovely evening in Israel. You've joined us today for geopolitics, military strategy, and the Israel-Hamas war. Uh, my name is Ron Hasner. I am the co-director of the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. I'm also the Helen Diller Family Chair in Israel Studies, and I'm a Chancellor's Professor of Political Science at UC Berkeley. Today we mark a full one month anniversary since the Hamas massacre of Israeli civilians at the start of the Israel Hamas war. This has been and continues to be an extremely challenging period for all of us here at the Helen Diller Institute, as it has for so many on our campus, in our community and around the world. In this difficult moment, our students have expressed a critical need for learning and community. Our staff and our faculty are working intensely on new ways to offer deep support for our students, creating daily opportunities for students, staff, and faculty to come together. As the past weeks since the Hamas massacre and the escalating Israel-Hamas war have demonstrated, polarization on college campuses is more severe than ever. It can be challenging for students to find spaces for complex and nuanced thinking and for respectful dialogue. Our institute, the Helen Diller Institute, is committed to restoring civil discourse, creating forums where students and the wider community can thoughtfully exchange ideas on complicated, deep-seated subjects. And our public programming reflects this goal. In the past few weeks, my colleague, uh, Professor Kenneth Bamberger, has interviewed Times of Israel senior analyst Haviv Retik Gour. Uh, the writer and psychologist Ayelet Gundar Goshen spoke with Professor Dina Aronoff about her role as an emergency mental health worker who is counseling the survivors of the Hamas attack. Uh, we've had New York Times Jerusalem correspondent Isabel Kirshner and Stanford journalism professor Janine Zakaria explore together this unprecedented moment in Israeli history and society. And you'll find recordings of all these events uh, on our website. All these events, all the activities of our institute are all supported by our community, and we thank you for that continued support. Uh, you can uh, see our website in the chat, and you can read more at that website about our mission, our work, and how you can support programs like these. Today, we are hosting a webinar with Haifa University professor Ehud Iran titled Geopolitics, Military Strategy, and the Israel-Hamas War. Ehud Iran is senior lecturer in the School of Political Science and the Department of International Relations at the University of Haifa. He works on spatial technological and legal aspects of international conflict, mostly in the Arab-Israeli context. He works on negotiation and conflict resolution, maritime strategy, and intelligence studies. He has held appointments at the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School, and he's been a visiting scholar at Stanford University, and most importantly, a visiting professor at uh, UC Berkeley in our program. As Professor Iran and I chat, please type your questions into the Q&A window so that I can ask them on your behalf. Erev Tov Udi. Good evening from Israel, Ron. Thank you uh, for having me on this program. Thank you for joining. So the Berkeley campus is in uh, turmoil these days. Uh, even though we are uh, many thousands away, miles away from where the action is, uh, what's the what's the University of Haifa campus like these days? How are students and faculty dealing with the reality of war? So the university is quite empty. The academic year was due to start on October fifteenth. We usually start after the Jewish high holidays, and it, due to the war, it was postponed twice in large part because about 30% of our students are reservists and are actually in the front lines, either in the South or in the North. Our dorms are hosting uh, civilians that were evacuated from Israel's Northern border. Some of them are, uh, are students, but most of them are not. Uh, our department specifically suffered a lot of casualties. We have over about 16 alumni were killed. Two current students were killed. One student was abducted to Gaza. Uh, and, and we have some other students that uh, lost first degree relatives. Um, the other interesting aspect of what's happening on our campus, we have about 40% of Israeli Arabs, Israeli Palestinians. And so although school is not in session, there is a lot of tension in various groups. 
Uh, we had uh, a bit of a cr academic crisis at the beginning of the war. Six students were postponed, were um, uh, put um, on probation. Yeah, on probation. I'm sorry, it's late here in Israel. So when you get tired, your English is <laughs> more rusty. Um, were put on probation because they put statements on various groups allegedly supporting the attack. This led to a letter of 25 faculty members, uh, 24 of them Jewish, calling the provost not to put them on probation, which then became national uh, news as if our university supports Hamas. And we have a lot of concern in the administration over when school resumes, hopefully in December, when you have on one hand reservists coming back from the front lines and uh, 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 Israeli-Palestinians who view the conflict very differently. So we're working actively on programs of conflict reduction and managing these emotions that we're expecting to see on campus. Wow. Um, let's talk a little about the strategic background uh, to the uh, to the Hamas assault uh, a month ago. Uh, how do we how do we understand why Hamas did what it did and why it did it then? Um, what can you say something about the Hamas Israel relationship uh, before the attack? So despite the deep animosity between the two parties, in particular Hamas's ideology of destroying Israel, in reality, they managed in some status quo, uh, there was some balance starting in 2009, in which Israel uh, allowed, if you will, uh, Hamas to uh, receive international aid, Israel supplied electricity, water, and goods that flew from Israel into the Gaza Strip, essentially to Hamas's hands. Uh, this was a result of two decisions. The prime minister decided that he wants to allow Hamas to um, control Gaza as a way to counterbalance against the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. And there was a, 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 a feeling among the security services that Hamas, despite its uh, ideology, is in fact the fact they're managing a territory would make them, if you will, more moderate or more constrained or dealing with a wider set of uh, of considerations which will lead them to attack Israel less. There were still uh, six or seven or eight rounds of fighting since 2009, depends how you count. But all in all, there was some balance, which is partly why we were so surprised by the attack. You ask a question, many of us ask, why did, uh, under these conditions, why did Hamas attack Israel essentially out of the blue? Um, so we don't have, of course, a full picture. Hamas did not lay out a clear statement of why they're doing it. The main arguments span from its ideological commitment to the destruction of Israel, as it appears in the 1988 covenant, and events that like unfolded two or three years ago. There was a whole semi-academic discussion in Gaza. Israel, once it's destroyed, uh, panelists discuss questions, what to do with the high-tech sector once we occupy Israel, and so on. Uh, the answer is you leave the high-tech people for a while and then you uh, remove them as well. Uh, so that would be one set of arguments. Then there are arguments that are inter-Palestinians. Uh, Hamas's desire to show a resistance, a pushback to Israel, as opposed to the PA, which was uh, more moderate and in a way cooperated with Israel, all the way to more um, regional arguments, uh, the Palestinian issue has been shoved aside for a while, and Israel was moving ahead with a relationship with faraway countries like the Gulf states. We became more and more intimate with the Saudis. So a rationalist explanation would say this was a way to push back against this removal of the Palestinian question. And if you look back in history, this is a recurring thing in the theme in the Palestinian national movement. It goes back to the 30s when you're feeling cornered you move to violence. We still don't have a clear answer. Why was this so vicious with so many atrocities, with targeting civilians, with abducting old people and babies? Um, th this is unprecedented in that respect. And so we're still remain, despite this set of rationalist explanations, we're still left with some unanswered uh, questions. That's very helpful. Can you say something about uh, the role of uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia in either setting the stage for the conflict or uh, intervening in, in the months after it started? Yeah, so the Saudi role, as I said, um, it's Sa Sa Saudi Arabia's rapprochement with Israel. 
I mean, historically, this is a country that was hostile. Uh, you know, Jews were not even allowed, not even Israelis, uh, until about a decade ago. And then in the last year and a half, two years, maybe a bit longer, we had rapprochement. Israelis, especially with dual nationality, were able to visit. There's even an unconfirmed report that Netanyahu visited secretly in November of last year, Saudi Arabia. Um, and so the Saudi behavior, one could argue, uh, it had encouraged Hamas to try and rattle this uh, rapprochement. Um, Saudi Arabia also, and this this again, one of the surprises of the war, once the war began, uh, the feeling here is that Saudi Arabia sees itself with all the limitations as part of an American, Israeli, moderate, what we call in political science, status quo actors in the region, including an unconfirmed report that a missile that was shot from Yemen towards Israel was at least one of these missiles was intercepted by a Saudi Patriot uh, battery. So we have and Netanyahu, our prime minister, a few days ago said he still hopes that once the war is over, we can go back to these relations with Saudi Arabia. So that's on the one side. The other side, uh, Iran heads what we would call in the jargon of our profession, the revisionist actors, don't, those who want to reshape the Middle East, pushing against this um, axis of pro-American, pro-stability actors. Um, they have trained and supplied Hamas with weapons and trained some of their people. Initially, there were some reports that they were directly involved in the attack. For now, we don't have direct evidence for that. Um, uh, but these are the two polars, if you will, if we move away from the immediate Israeli-Palestinian clash. These are the regional actors that this war is going to affect them and are in various ways indirectly involved. And, and the Iranian goal here is to torpedo... Uh, this sort of anti-Iranian axis that is forming around Israel, or uh, do you think the Iranian goal might be more ambitious? You know, I'm not. A, I'm not to be fully honest. I'm not. You know, not an Iran expert, but its general foreign policy is to shape a region that is more friendly to it. Uh, and the the main actor that made in this area unfriendly for Iran, seen from Tehran, is the United States. It invaded its two neighbors, Iraq and Afghanistan. And so a lot of its actions here are to try and encircle the U.S.'s closest ally in the region, which is Israel. Uh, it, of course, has the ideological layer, the Iranian regime in various uh, strengths over time committed to the destruction of Israel. But it's, tr it's distancing itself from direct involvement now. I mean, even the attacks on Israel from Hezbollah and from Yemen are by Iranian proxies, not Iran directly. Yeah. Um, okay, getting a little closer to the to the matter at hand, um, how might you summarize Israel's goals uh, in the current campaign in in Gaza right now? What what does it what does it mean <coughs> to uh, eliminate Hamas? Is there is it even possible to eliminate a a terror organization? Yeah. So there are three stated goals. One, as you said, eliminate Hamas. This is expressed in various degrees, and I'll say something about the fine grain you're hinting at. The second uh, thing is provide security for Israel's citizens. What the um, attack on October 7th proved, you cannot be a neighbor of an actor, even if it's a non-state actor, that can unleash such set of atrocities on your civilians close to the border. Um, and so this would be providing security. And the third goal, which was initially more lower in the pecking order, but I think is moving up, is releasing the 260 uh, abductees, uh, people who were uh, high, you know, taken away to Gaza. Many of them, by the way, not Israeli citizens. We have between 20 and 40 Thai workers that were abducted. So it partly explains the international aspect of it. And then you raise, I think, the question that's on all of us minds. What can you dismantle Hamas? And what does it mean to dismantle Hamas? Is Hamas simply a set of institutions or is it an idea, an ideology that cannot be removed by force? So I think Israeli leadership is, is offering a more fine-grained answer in the last uh, few days, which is dismantle the institutions uh, and the military prowess of the organization. But some of the discussions, I think, more internally are what is the organization you're concerned about? Because even civil servants in Gaza are Hamas. So there's no openly public discussion, but I'm, I suspect that we would like civil life to continue, you know, provide services. So that would mean leaving some layer of the civil service in place, 
but removing military capabilities and political control. And I think to, to Israel's somewhat surprise, we have international support from it, including from the United States, that you cannot have Hamas uh, uh, going on uh, ruling Gaza. In the ideological sphere, which you may have hinted to also is an idea, and here I'm drawing on discussions. I participate in a few dialogues with Arab colleagues. And in fact, next week, I'm going to Cyprus for two days for uh, talks with people from the region. And they are talking about the clash of ideas in the broader region of regional actors looking at a political armed for political Islam or the resistance, Mukawama. Uh, and their sense is that a defeat for Hamas, not only mil militarily, but also not gaining support from the region, for example. Even this distancing that Iran is a bit signaling uh, will also mean a defeat. So there is an immediate military material defeat, but there's also an element on the war of ideas, which is regional, and many people are looking around. It's not only Israelis who are very angry at what happened at October 7th. It's also a clash, a regional clash of ideas. That's interesting. I, 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 I might have more questions about that. But but before that, sort of a, a, a technical question. Um, how how does one use infantry, armor, air power, intelligence in uh, one of the most crowded places in the world uh, in order to conduct, I guess it's a combination of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operation. Uh, so what, what does that actually, what does that look like? Uh, is this primarily <laughs> conducted from the air? Is it primarily conducted on the ground with some air support before, after, during? Let me add two other challenges. First of all, you right, you point correctly. We know that urban warfare in this very dense area with high rises and so on is extremely complex. It took months and months for the American forces to conduct similar operations in Iraq uh, and against ISIS in Syria. In Gaza, there's another complication. Hamas took a lot of the provisions they received from the international community, like cement and built a massive underground tunnel network. Some people say up to 500 kilometers. I don't know if that's true, but it doesn't make sense to me, the numbers, but it's it's very big. So the challenge is above ground, but also underground. Um, um, it means, so how you do something like this? First of all, you need as much as you can detailed intelligence. So that would mean, you know, aerial photography of houses, streets, uh, heights of houses as forces move into streets just to get a sense where you can be seen from, where you can be shot at. Israel keeps a lot of the specific under wraps. So unlike those of, her, those of us who remember the Iraq war in 2003 when you had embedded journalists, Israel chose a different approach this time. And in fact, even Israeli citizens were not fully aware in the first day or two of the incursion into Gaza that's actually happening. So we can't really give a full picture. A lot of it is comes from outside sources, but it means uh, uh, using uh, infantry that goes literally and tanks in the streets. You have to deal with these high rises buildings and you have to deal with the tunnels. And it seems the approach Israel took was massive use of air power to try and deal with some of these buildings and with some of the tunnels. It also, again, we don't have the full details, but there's some technological solutions once you're on the ground to deal with the tunneling. Um, but it's pretty much under wraps. Um, and you have to balance, of course, this population security. I mean, there is a lot, unfortunately, a lot of civilian casualties, but Israel's approach in general is to try and minimize them. Uh, at least in the past, I don't know, in this operation, we had a, a lawyer in the division level uh, uh, conducting, affecting decision-making on the ground. Um... Uh, okay, so so we could now go in in, in multiple directions, and I, I see people are also also asking this uh, in the Q and A, and I'd encourage all of you to type more questions uh, into the Q and A because I, I will I will interweave them with my own questions. Um, uh, drone warfare plays a role in this as well, is that right? Yes. So here, there's one of our failures in October seventh. We saw in Ukraine massive use of drones. We Israel built. Uh, units that use drones. In fact, the command, the command uh, there was a new brigade that was integrating this and the commander unfortunately was killed on the first day. Um, there's multiple use. Uh, first drones were used by Hamas to dismantle some of our sensors on the fence, which allowed the breach of the fence and then the entry of the Hamas forces. 
there was a, at least one incident of a, of a drone uh, throwing a bomb at a tank. Unfortunately, the soldiers there opened the cover and then this allowed uh, ground forces to enter and, and uh, you know, harm the people inside. Um, but Israel is quick. Uh, so tanks already uh, did, even in private, in some cases with private welders, did these covers against drones. And there's very quick learning to try and deal with, with the drone situation. Uh, I hear from friends where their kids are in some units. In some cases, soldiers just, just bought drones privately for their own uh, their own use. So there is some there has been some work in the last few years how to integrate drones and how to protect yourself from drones. In the first few days of the fighting, unfortunately, it wasn't fully implemented. So uh, you know, according to uh, according to uh, Hamas. Um, the casualties are now exceeding, uh, uh, the Palestinian casualties are now exceeding 10,000. Uh, th that's obviously not a number uh, anyone outside the BBC would take seriously. Um, but even if the number is, is half as much, and even if half of that number is, um, is actual Hamas people, uh, we're still talking about, about high numbers of civilian casualties uh, among Palestinians. How would... Uh, a, an army conducting warfare with tanks, with armored personnel carriers, with uh, missiles and bombs, uh, seek to minimize civilian casualties when their opponent's primary goal is to maximize civilian casualties. You're muted. First of all, in the IDF, at least when I was serving and I know for sure later was on still engaged, there is an effort to be conscientized to this issue. For example, in officer school, you are taught that there is, even if your commanding officer tells you to, in some cases, harm civilians, and you can, as a soldier, make a judgment that's an illegal order and you, you are allowed to disobey. It. That's based on a case that happened in 1956. So, Element number one, you teach soldiers to deal with, to think about this. Uh, and then they're very practical moves. As you know, Israel asked the people in the area it operates, the northern area of the Gaza Strip, where Gaza City is and where the headquarters of Hamas is, to evacuate. And hundreds of thousands of people left the northern Gaza Strip to the south. It's a huge humanitarian challenge and disaster. And although, like many Israelis, I'm enraged by what happened October 7th, I also feel the pain of the people who have to leave their houses and their houses are destroyed. And I know many of them are not Hamas supporters. They just happen to live under vicious government. So you move the people out. Uh, Israel opened even after the time frame it allotted to it, it. It created what's called the humanitarian corridor, notifying people they will not operate in a certain area that allows civilians to uh, operate. Um, uh, and then in the use of fire, if you have a clear indication that citizens are in a place you are about to attack, you're not supposed to attack there. And finally, there's, there's some warnings. Uh, you may have seen on television, the IDF called people in buildings and asked them to evacuate in half an hour, 14 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it's urban warfare. Um, uh, in, as you said, one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Uh, and so we have these uh, high numbers of casualties. So given the high number of casualties, how does one assess how careful a military has been? Uh, you, you can't just uh, compare uh, absolute numbers. Um, and, and I've seen all sorts of strange comparisons. Uh, Palestinian body counts versus Israeli body counts or this year's Palestinian uh, body counts versus uh, three years ago. Um, how does how does one talk about proportionality in these conditions? How, how do I back the statement uh, that I've often made, because I agree with you, that Israel and the United States are among the most careful militaries worldwide when it comes to efforts at discriminating positively between civilians and, and militants, uh, unlike, say, the Russian military? How, how do I how do I show this? Yeah, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer. I can share with you some of the measurements that were used in the past. So once the fighting ends, you can, it's very it's very hard to talk about these things. You know, we talk about it as political scientists in these somewhat cold and distance yeah. ways. But, but uh, and here I apologize in a way to our listeners that we, we, we're only also fully aware that 
each loss is in Judaism is a whole world. But one way people are doing it, they're counting the number of, uh, of um, uh, enemy combatants, if you will, that were killed versus civilians. Mm -hmm. uh, so somewhat hard to do, but let's say in Hezbollah in the 90s, Hezbollah did obituaries for all the combatants. So in our massive fire operations in Lebanon in the 90s, which are the forefathers of what we're seeing now to a degree, you were able through the obituaries uh, to look at numbers. So that's 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 one way of, uh, uh, of doing it. The other way is to look at the measures the military is taking, uh, the warnings, uh, the uh, willingness to do short ceasefires, the supply of electricity, fuel, um, you know, Israel has the capability of shutting the water to Gaza, big parts of it, so, which we did for a short time, then we reopened it. So I'd say it's a whole set of various measurements, uh, and it still remains somewhat vague. Uh, and as you also intimated, different parties counted differently. And we saw with this alleged Israeli bombing of a hospital with 500 casualties within 12 hours, it was clear it wasn't Israel and it's not 500. So this is another layer of the conversation here. Yeah. So one of the members of our audience asks, why, why is the goal, why is the priority uh, attacking Hamas? Why is the priority not uh, uh, releasing uh, hostages? Um, which I'm assuming, based on the way the question is phrased, would be primarily a diplomatic move. So we did had we did have one single special forces operation with with some information and one soldier, Ori Magidish, was released in a in an in a assault of the ISA, the Internal Security Agency. Um, and here maybe, I'll, but to answer your question, I'll maybe answer a bit emotionally. In the first few days, for most of the public. It was horrific, the abductions, you know, as I said, babies, older people, and so on. But there was a real fear that this is a threat, and you have to launch a war to, to, de to deflect the threat, even if, God forbid, some of your people will be killed. You know, there were full settlements that were essentially occupied for up to 24 hours by a terrorist group that can move onwards. You know, not, I live in the center of Israel, not too far from here. An Israeli guy was shot to death on the second day because he was suspected. I mean, there was real hysteria nationwide. It reminded me the first day of the Yom Kippur War, in which we also had hundreds of POWs, but there was a sense you're in a war and you have to do what you have to do. This changed a bit over time. But still, I think the overriding sentiment of the government is you have to deal with the root cause of the, of, of this, of this, of the threat. Um, but uh, it is going, the, the issue of um, uh, hostages is going higher on the uh, list of priorities. And again, it's not confirmed, but there are all sorts of uh, claims that uh, Israel was offered or is or did offer some short ceasefire, at least for releasing Palestinian women prisoners that were tried, by the way, against the women and children that are held. For now, nothing of this materialized. Um, yeah, a, a, a young, a young guest who's watching our talk by the name of Ori wants to know, uh, whether, whether you think there's a way, even though all these operations are happening, uh, you know, obviously with, with a great degree of secrecy, whether there is a way, um, for Israel to make it clearer, to demonstrate, uh, the caution that it is engaging in and the efforts that it is investing in not targeting civilians. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, first of all, you sh you can share the information more. Uh, so I think earlier today there was a this, there was a or maybe it was yesterday. Israel again offered the humanitarian corridor. So what you do for other purposes, you literally you can release the radio exchanges. The commander telling his sub commander stop firing this area of civilians. We can share the leaflets. Uh, we can share television inserts of Israelis calling. There was this insert that I referred to, I think it was CNN or BBC, that the owner of a building got a call. Someone said, I'm from the IDF, we're about to bomb your building in an hour, please evacuate. So Israel, I think, can do a greater effort. It's on people's awareness, but um, yeah, uh, maybe more can be done. I don't follow enough the foreign media to tell you how much this is aired. Um, 
Uh, not much. In fact, I, I think it's easy to get the the, the wrong uh, perception in the foreign media that mm -hmm. Israel is not at all constrained in its use of force, mm -hmm. uh, which, which suggests to me that the foreign media does not know much about Israel's military capabilities uh, mm -hmm. or has perhaps forgotten um, about about what the Israeli Air Force uh, can do. Um, uh, the resistance to to a ceasefire uh, is uh, is is because there's a worry that this would allow Hamas to regroup in some way, or um, or would take some pressure off Hamas. Like, why not engage in a 24 hour or 48 hour ceasefire? Yeah, I think I think 24 hour ceasefire, especially on humanitarian grounds, is possible. Uh, you know, we did have this in the past. So I, I can't answer you. This could be maybe some operational reasoning. We're very close to the Hamas headquarters. I honestly don't know. And I think it's not out of the question, especially for humanitarian purposes. Maybe one concern would be is if you go into a ceasefire, you won't be able to resume fire. Uh, we know this from sometimes from other conflicts. Uh, and the broader concern is that Israel will not achieve its goal. We had multiple rounds of violence, including uh, incursions into Gaza. In previous rounds, but now it feels different that there was such a harm for civilians that you cannot simply uh, leave with this organization. You have to go uh, all the way. What what role is the United States uh, playing uh, in this conflict, both uh, on the naval scene and uh, and in Israel itself? So this is a dramatic moment, I think, for the U.S. engagement with the region and maybe even globally. This is way beyond what all of us, everyone expected, even in the evening of the first day of the attack. So President Biden took a very uh, drastic leadership role in supporting Israel. He showed up here, I think it was in the first week, I don't know if you can you remember, but it was while fighting was going, while missiles were, sh were shot at Israel and at the airport, the uh, president came here, showed uh, unwielding support despite some opposition in his party. Uh, and the U.S. put its uh, money where its mouth uh, is. It deployed two aircraft carrier groups to the region very quickly. One of them, portions of one of them went down to the Red Sea and participated in the interception of ballistic missiles that were fired from over 2,000 or around 2,000 kilometers away. Uh, 1,600 kilometers to 2,000, we're not exactly sure. Uh, and were fired from Yemen to Israel. So the U.S. deployed force, showed political support, uh, 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 Secretary Blinken, that was here already a number of times, told to his ad Arab interlocutors in a press conference that Hamas cannot remain in, in uh, Gaza. And at the same time, you know, we are sophisticated political scientists. I hope you understand that such support is also an embrace that constrains you for a, way, for a while, for in a way. Um, so these humanitarian uh, 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 requests for ceasefire, if the U.S., will insist on them. Israel will have, I think, will have to accept it. The other component here um, uh, is that the U.S. Uh, deployed personnel to advise Israel. Uh, this came because the U.S. has this long history of urban warfare in the region, but it also may have indicated limited trust in the decision-making process in Israel. It's not very pleasant to say as an Israeli, but we have a government with extremist elements, uh, and Israel historically you know, it's very good. That's separate from the ideology of elements in the government, but you go on a first move for a war to deflect the threat, but there's not always an exit strategy. Uh, we entered Lebanon in 1982 for a short war that was promised to the public to be 48 hours in June 1982. We ended up being there 18 years, uh, including three of my late teenager years as a soldier. Um, and so the, the U.S. has this multiple roles, on one hand, strong support. On the other hand, engagement that's unprecedented. Let me also remind you that American citizens were murdered and some of the abductees are Americans. And Hamas even con limited the ability of Palestinian Americans to leave Gaza. Initially, eventually, they were let out, or most of them. So um, uh, there's also direct uh, American involvement in that respect. Uh, and also there were reports, although I don't know if it's confirmed, that American UAVs are operating above Gaza. Uh, explain, for, you, explain UAV. I'm sorry, unmanned um, uh, aerial vehicles. Uh, uh, I don't know if that's true. That would be, again, unprecedented of operating together. 
possibly because there are dozens of Americans also among the abductees. Uh, and the uh, U.S. Navy has uh, moved significant assets into the Eastern Mediterranean. Two aircraft carriers now a nuclear submarine. What yeah. is their What is their purpose? What are they hoping to accomplish? So the, a huge effort on the part of America, but also it's aligned with Israel's interest, is to deter Hezbollah from intervening. On our northern border, we have a Shiite Lebanese organization closely aligned with Iran, also committed to destruction of Israel and also deterred for many, many years. Um, and the big concern or the big challenge is if Hezbollah intervenes. They have a much bigger missile capability. According to some reports, 160,000 rockets that can reach big portions of Israel. Um, Israel already said it will, of course, respond in Lebanon, and we still have greater firepower than uh, Hezbollah. Uh, and so it seems that the American assets here are here to signal to Hezbollah and possibly Iran that if they intervene, potentially they will be harmed by U.S. assets. So it's a way to contain the conflict as much as you can between Israel and Hamas. It's not fully contained already. Uh, our foes from Yemen intervene. Uh, uh, I read somewhere, by the way, this use of the ballistic missile was the longest operational use of a ballistic missile in human hi in military history. Um, and Hezbollah is nudging us on the border. It had fired uh, rock uh, rockets and uh, anti-tank missiles at civilian targets, very close to the border usually, and we responded. So there is a low level conflict below the threshold of war. Uh, in the north, and the American assets are there to make sure uh, or support uh, uh, that the arena will remain Israel-Hamas uh, rather than a broader regional conflict. But how would they do that? Uh, and and I guess my, my political science question is, how do you deter greater Hezbollah involvement and perhaps even direct Iranian involvement without also escalating the situation uh, and adding and adding fuel to the fire? So you have diplomatic channels, you know, the US we know talks to the Iranians directly, indirectly through Qatar, for example. Um, so according again to reports, I cannot confirm the US had sent multiple messages to both Hezbollah and uh, Iran not to uh, intervene, potentially hinting that it will use uh, its assets. And um, when you have so much metal and so many missiles uh, in, uh, in the sea who can reach all these targets in Lebanon, that is that is a has a deterrent effect and let me remind you 1982 the u.s had fired from the east mediterranean to targets at lebanon when after the marines uh, were attacked and 241 marines were killed by syrian proxy if i remember correctly the americans attacked syrian targets in lebanon so we already have a history of using it and Hezbollah, has, you know, it has many considerations. Uh, it's also a Lebanese actor. Uh, it serves Iranian interests. Maybe it's not Iran's interest to waste the Hezbollah power now. So the combination of diplomacy and showing force without being too aggressive. So you send the messages secretly, for example. Uh, although here it's I'm mostly guessing and based on previous uh, conflicts rather than any direct information. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I agree with everything you said. I, I'm still puzzled by what you would do with a nuclear submarine. Um, un unless unless the idea was to threaten Tehran itself. Um, but again, it's very, very hard to deter uh, the, the leadership in Tehran without also escalating the situation and uh, and raising the stakes. The beauty of naval platforms is that uh, they have this ambiguous role. I mean, they're international waters. Some of it, you know, is to the second aircraft carrier group, I think, is heading to American bases in the Persian Gulf. So the beauty of uh, these platforms is they do something that's routine and could be also understood as international waters. This is very different from, let's say, the American intervention in Lebanon in 1958 when you had Marines landing on the uh, shores of Beirut. Um, so and as for the nuclear submarines, the engine is nuclear, if you will, and maybe they have nuclear weapons, I don't know, but they also carry traditional ballistic missiles, uh, which of course can be shot from further away, but you put them in international waters in the region, it signals we can bring a lot of firepower close uh, close by. Um, and as you're saying this, it's occurring to me that this may be a signal to Russia as well about 
not just American capabilities, but also America's commitment to its allies. And in this case, I'm not just referring to Israel, but I'm also referring to Saudi Arabia and and, uh, and Egypt um, as allies. Uh, there are some interesting, very interesting technical questions uh, in in the Q and A that I'd like to I'd like to throw at you. Uh, you. Are you holding up okay? I know it's it's almost eleven o'clock at night. Um, you're doing okay. Um, yeah. So so one one question. Um, has to do it's it's a great question about counterinsurgency and how important the civilian population is in counterinsurgency now hamas obviously is using 2 million gazans and uh 250 israelis as as human shields uh and we've talked a little about israeli efforts to uh to to restrain and distinguish between combatants and non-combatants even though again you're fighting an opponent whose goal it is to make that impossible um is there any effort you think uh, by Israel to engage the Palestinian population in Gaza? Uh, I, I guess I'm, now these are words I'm adding, a, a hearts and minds component? First of all, this is very different from counterinsurgency American context that you're sending forces far away to a foreign land like Vietnam or Iraq. Gaza and Israel are very close. Gaza is 70 kilometers from Tel Aviv. Uh, before the first intifada, we had hundreds of thousands of Gazans coming to, into Israel daily. Uh, even under Hamas rule, Israel uh, gave work permits to 15 to 20,000 Gazans who crossed the border every day. So there is a long interaction between these uh, two communities. Um, but I think the language of counterinsurgency in the American sense is not fully deployed here for a number of reasons. First of all, Hamas is not simply... Maoist people operating in the jungle. This is a political party that won the Palestinian elections in 2006 and in 2007 overtook Gaza by force. So it's a semi-sovereign government that provides governance uh, services like, I don't know, garbage, paving the road. So it's not a classical counterinsurgency. So that's one component. Second component, I think there's a notion that in this region there's a gap between the leadership and the people and unfortunately the people don't always affect the leadership for example we see popular uh, resentment to israel even with countries we have peace agreements with like egypt and jordan but still the leadership wants the peace agreements so i think in the minds of many of us we got used to this gap between leadership even though it was elected many many years ago but essentially is running a non-democratic uh, uh, semi-sovereign semi, semi, semi state. And finally, I would say there's a lot of anecdotal stories that seem not to do anything. Hamas is led in Gaza by a gentleman called Yichia Sinwar, who spent decades, I think close to 20 years in Israeli jails, maybe less. He had a brain tumor, a very dangerous brain tumor while he was in jail. Israeli doctors saved his life. Um, and made huge effort to make sure he 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 live. Uh, and when he was released, he became this very radical uh, leader. It was already known in jail that he's going to be a leader. He's re released from jail in 2011 in a previous exchange. So even this story of uh, Ichya Sinwar personally, who, who would not have lived if he wasn't in jail because of the level of medicine in Israel, and yet he had masterminded this horrific attack uh, uh, on close to a thousand Israeli civilians. Um, yeah, I can add a bit. Yeah, anyways, I can go into the history of the thinking about counterinsurgency here, but I think for now this will suffice. Unless you want to, I want me to add. Yeah. Um, so, so and an, another question that's popping up in the Q and A um, has to do with um, the the Hamas point of view uh, of of the current fighting in Gaza. Do we know? Uh, how Hamas is faring? How many uh, how many members it's it's lost? How much of its infrastructure is still up and working, and what it's capable of? Because it the the um, rockets into Israel have continued uh, seven thousand, I believe, so far since uh, yeah, in the last in the last month, which is a, a massive number uh, compared to prior instances. So, uh, is there a way to tell if Hamas is uh, is slowly coming undone? So first of all, in the attack on October 7th, there were uh, about 1,500 from Hamas elite forces, a force called the Nukba. Um, they lost a few hundred, pe a few hundred people, uh, and about 200 uh, were uh, caught by Israel. So already in this first wave of attack, they lost uh, a portion of their special forces. Um, 
uh, we know that. The, what's happening on the ground, Hamas does not confront directly the Israeli forces. So we don't have massive fighting on the streets like Stalingrad. It seems that what's happening is, uh, again, this is a, under a lot of wraps of censorship and we don't have a full picture, but uh, it seems uh, Hamas forces are trying to fire missiles at Israeli forces, you know, coming from the tunnel system, shooting, coming back. A few cases of booby traps, a few cases maybe of UAVs, these uh, unmanned plane dropping small bomblets, but we don't have a direct uh, confrontation. Uh, so for now, we did not see any significant breakup. Israel also took out about 13 what Israel calls battalion commanders. So this is mid-level management, if you will and a few senior uh, uh, people in the military establishment. But beyond that, Hamas for now is standing. Um, the rockets are, the numbers are going down. So this, there were many more sirens in the early days. Now there's much less, uh, uh, much less sirens. Uh, so they lost a lot of people. A lot of people are being held in Israel and are being investigated, but we don't have a, a, a crackdown. This again has an ideological component. Uh, some people here understand Hamas is a committed religious organization that its main purpose is not necessarily a traditional victory, but uh, uh, the show uh, of resistance, even dying a Marty's hero, a, a, a Marty's death. Um, as you may recall, the Shiite uh, sect of Islam, which is the uh, minority, the, the majority is Sunni, began at a battle in which the person that carried the message uh, uh, was was killed by the what now we call the Sunnis. So the founding moment of the of Shia is a defeat, and is celebrated every year in the holiday called Ashura, in which people wound themselves. Wound themselves. So again, I'm not a, I'm not one for just explaining any everything in ideology, but these are not simple military measurements. There's also this ideological component, and and what stands out. Sad for me to say, but even if we defeat Hamas. What they did to us in October 7th will remain uh, as, an, as, a, as an example, if you will, for these people. Um, so you, you, you brought up this, the, 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 Shia, the Shia Sunni tension, which makes the relationship between Iran and Hamas, a relatively new relationship, uh, makes it makes it very interesting. Uh, Eric Rodas, who uh, co-chairs our, our Institute's community board, uh, wondered what your thoughts are on Iranian training and supplies to Hamas uh, in the months before this attack. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll first say a word on what you hinted more broadly. So uh, just to clarify, Hamas, as most Palestinian, is a Sunni organization. Iran is Shia. One of his strategies is developing this Shiite crescent, which does not include Hamas because that's not a Shiite organization. And contrary to what you hear sometimes, Hamas is not simply a proxy or an extension of Iran. In fact, the two had a, a love-hate relationship. There were periods they were very close. There were periods they were distant. For example, while Iran supported the regime in Syria, Hamas supported the rebels. And so this led to a rift, which was uh, repaired. We do know for a fact that there was a, a training of Hamas people by the Iranians. If I understand correctly, some of the weapons that were caught were Iranian made. So there was general training. Uh, for example, some of the stuff we caught was maps of how they did the military plan planning, which is looks like state grade, if you will. So these are these were people who were trained or thinking of the attack in more conventional military ways, which may indicate uh, Iranian involvement. There were also reports in the first few days of people in the kibbutzim that were attacked hearing Farsi, but this was not confirmed. And in fact, I saw yesterday a report saying that's probably not true. So I would say there was general training for some of the people. There was some supply of arms. Again, this is very preliminary, uh, but we don't see indications of direct involvement on the ground. Remember also Gaza is besieged, not easy to move in and out goods uh, into it. Uh, most of the questions in the Q and A are uh, about what's uh, what's going to happen next. Uh, so so let me let me let me turn to some of those. Um, uh, first, I wonder if you could comment more generally on uh, the sort of rift in Israeli society that we've witnessed in the last six months to one year, and how this war has affected uh, that 
protest movement, the anti-Netanyahu movement, but also sort of the underlying tensions between secular and religious, left and right, pro-Netanyahu, anti-Netanyahu um, in, in the country, just in, in broader terms. Okay, so as you know, since January, once the government, the new government, uh, tried to change some of the constitutional order, there was a massive response by civil society to oppose this. Um, and it Israel indicated or showed to the world that it has this huge internal rift. If you will, Israel's traditional elites, um, the military leadership, the high tech, academia, opposed the government. Uh, while the government supported the government, it was a coalition of people who wanted to change the constitutional order. And in fact, Israeli military intelligence had warned the politicians four times before the attack that the region around us views Israel as an internal rift in the moment of weakness. Partly because a lot of the people that rallied against the government were previous military leadership, even reservists in some units that are very important, relies heavily on reservists. So you can do your reserve and then go and demonstrate. So one debate that's going to unfold is what, who is at fault to this projection of internal weakness? We already have leaks from the environment of the prime minister saying it was the people who opposed me. And of course, the people who oppose the prime minister say it was the crazy government that tried to change the constitutional order. But there were some unintended consequences that actually provided better resilience. So the people who opposed the government organized out of the, you know, in a very short time into very effective networks of opposition to the government. They raised a lot of money. And because a lot of them come from high tech or the military, they organized very well. Some of the protests were military type, you got the SMS at 6 a.m., be in this in this place. These people love Israel. They don't just don't like the government. They're also fully committed to the traditional model of the Zionist project. And so they turn themselves to organizations that are, instead of opposing the government, they're supporting civil resilience. So within two or three days, hundreds of people came to a central location in Tel Aviv, created a small corporation with uh, uh, 15 departments dealing with various aspects of resilience while the state institutions moved slower. A department that analyzed footage from Gaza looking for abductees, a department that supplied units that were missing a material. Um, uh, some of the wealthy people in Israel sent their private jets to pick up reservists from abroad. We had about 2000 Israelis, according to some measures, I, and my guess is more, who flew out, who flew to Israel to join the fighting. So it reminds me a bit of the Yom Kippur War, which, as you may in 1973, another surprise attack that happened on Israel's holiest day. Potentially, the other side thought, you know, all the Jews are in shul, so they won't show up. But in fact, having everyone in shul allowed to recruit them very quickly. So here, this weakness of an organization that opposed the government uh, then was turned very quickly to a, a resilient comp a component that allowed society to be more resilient in the face uh, of this challenge. Um, and in that sense, it seems uh, that Hamas miscalculated uh, in its timing. Yep. Um, the, the 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 tear in Israeli society, uh, as you and I have talked about often, uh, was was really quite deep, and uh, there was a there was a real concern about whether or not this this sort of uh, civil society could could prevail in a sense. Um, and Hamas has uh, perversely done much to unite Israelis. Uh, from different backgrounds. Um, what does this mean for Netanyahu's future? Uh, I'll just piggyback one more word on what you said. So this is an old insight in the Arab world. Habib Bourguiba, the mythological leader of Tunisia, post-colonial Tunisia, said in the 1960s, the Jews have so many different visions for the Jewish state. The only reason they're together is an external foe. We should actually offer peace to the Israelis and they'll finish up themselves. So yet again, as you say, in the face of external threat, uh, and especially I think the barbarity of the attacks that did not discriminate between peace activists, ironically, we have peace activists that were abducted to Gaza and were mur murdered, and religious people in development towns uh, uh, at least added this component. Uh, the big political question is exactly what you're saying. Prime Minister Netanyahu is in power since 2009. He's the longest serving politician in Israel. Um, uh, he, he is, a, is I said earlier, try to change essentially the constitutional order with this government that represented Israel's more right wing segments were out of the pale, quite honestly, before. Uh, 
Um, uh, he's, he's, first of all, he looked in shock. In his own image, his own calling, uh, he is the big protector of Israel. You know, he had warned against terrorism in the 90s. He had warned against Iran in the 2000s. He went to the U.S. Congress to protest the Iranian nuclear project. And here in his, in his shift, uh, there was this enormous disaster. It's the single bloodiest day of casualties in 120 years of Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, you know, 1,200 Israelis were killed in the watch of the person that is in his own image is the great protector of the people. So I, I'm not a psychologist. It's hard to see him from afar, but this must have an effect on everyone uh, in terms of his life's mission. Secondly, the policy he had led, no negotiation with the PA, allow Hamas to uh, uh, grow to a degree, uh, had failed in full honesty full honesty to Netanyahu, fairness to Netanyahu, he was also supported by the military establishment who saw Hamas as being more constrained. Uh, but the policy he led failed. Uh, of course, the counter argument is, would the negotiation be possible? Would we see a peace agreement? So he has a personal blow. He has a political failure of his vision. And finally, the government is underperforming. It took it a while to support the relocated people. We have according to some measures, 200,000 Israeli internal refugees, people who left the South and the North. Government was slow to respond to that. The government did not show a lot of compassion. We had very few ministers going to funerals. Um, some people that their family members were abducted were not approached by the state two weeks after this had happened. So there's also a management issue, which goes back to his approach which became increasingly populist. In other words, appoint, weaken the traditional civil service and appoint people who are political loyalists, no matter how they perform. And they didn't perform very well, as one can expect. So these are the challenges he's facing. Um, um, but he's a very determined politician. There's, it's not a coincidence that he's a prime minister for so long. And he's already hinting, not directly, but indirectly, what would be his lines of defense. And he will give a strong fight. He's an experienced, seasoned, smart, intelligent politician. And although he suffered these severe political blows uh, and he's at risk, um, you know, he's going to he's going to fight. Uh, my own guess is that he won't survive, but it's not a foregone conclusion. Yeah, I mean, if the Yom Kippur War is the correct metaphor, uh, this should lead ultimately to the resignation of the government. Uh, what what lines of defense could Netanyahu offer? So first, this is all based on leaks that people close to him are feeding the media. Line number one, and he's correct in that line, the security establishment supported my policy. They also felt that Hamas is constrained. Uh, so that's one line of defense. And he was very quick to some people's taste, too quick to say that he was only notified about the warnings. As you may know, there were warnings in the last few hours before the attack that were discussed by the chief of staff and the head of the internal security agency. I was not notified about this, what was happening in the night. At 6.29, one minute before the attack was the first time I heard about it. Uh, so that's one line of defense, which was essentially already aired. Second line of defense is, ah, and so he was very careful not to take responsibility. The military leadership and the internal security agency heads said, it's our fault. Essentially, they said, we're going to resign after this. This is a huge blunder. He was very careful not to say that. Uh, so one line of defense security establishment is responsible. I'm the chairman of the board. I'm not the CEO. The CEO failed, but I'll stay the chairman of the board. Uh, second argument is, the internal weakness we had projected is not my fault. And again, you can see the rationale in this argument. I was elected, changing constitutional order was in my purview. The people who show the weakness are those who demonstrated against me. So that's second line of defense. And in fact, he said it yesterday. If we investigate, we have to see was Sinwar, our fr a friend from the uh, head of Hamas in uh, Gaza, was he... A, was he sensing the opportunity that my opponents had created for him. And finally, there's always the possibility of reframing the political debate. For example, one of his close associates, Galit Distal Astabrian, yesterday gave a speech uh, emphasizing the traditional religious elements of the country. Because as you said earlier, there's also a tension here between more secular nationalistic uh, version of Zionism and a religious version. 
And the people who say the religious version can say just, you know, support Netanyahu because he offers a state that's closer to your vision. Uh, so if I have to be his strategist, these will be my three uh, uh, recommendations. And in fact, obviously, we're seeing at least two of them uh, already suggested. Uh, excellent. Okay, that brings us to uh, to talking about the future. I, I want to get back to to something you said about uh, uh, sort of regional tensions around ideology. Who opposes Hamas and who supports Hamas? Um, do you do you do you have a hunch? I mean, is it it is sometimes portrayed as the street versus the governments? Uh, no regional government in its right mind, other than Iran, uh, would support a destabilizing component like this, and an Islamist ideology like this. Um, but the street supports it, uh, supports Hamas, or the street supports uh, Palestinians in the abstract somehow? Is that what's going on? So by the street, I'm assuming you mean other countries like... Egypt, in the Middle Jordan, East, so yeah. Um, I'll say a few things. So on the, on, the, on the broader level, the debate in the Arab world for the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years is what's the best political system for us to manage our challenges? They tried constitutional monarchy that was closer to the West, did not work. Then they tried national secular socialism, didn't work. And Hamas is a manifestation of the third wave of a solution to the Arab problems in the Arab world, political Islam. There's only one country in this region that is run by political Islam, that's Iran, Shiite, Hamas is Muslim, and it's not doing Sunni. so great. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, Iran is Shia, Hamas is Sunni. Um, it's not doing so great. Uh, what, from what we understand, the public in Iran is not supporting the, the republic, and it's considered not a great solution to the challenges of modern Arab and Middle Eastern countries. Uh, so in that respect, the model Hamas is uh, offering is going to be judged in a way on its delivery. So it didn't deliver very good uh, public services. We know from polling and from anecdotal evidence that even the public in Gaza did not support Hamas that much, but they live in a semi-dictatorial entity, so they, they'll do it. But Hamas does offer a resistance to Israel. So Israel in the Arab, in many of the Arab streets, and unfortunately in these dialogues I'm having with colleagues in the region, like in Turkey, even countries like Turkey that are not Arab but are in the region, feel that Israel is an illegitimate entity. Because we are strong, because we provide some goods to the region, the leadership in these countries is willing to do business with us, including peace accords. But the general sentiment, unfortunately, is oppositional to us. We are perceived as an illegitimate entity here. And, but we're winning, you know, from a tiny a community of 650,000 people in 1948, we are now 9 million people, much stronger, GDP per capita, much greater than all our countries combined. Uh, so we won in a, in a way, at least until October, and the only Arab groups that managed to inflict pain on Israel were armed resistance. Hezbollah uh, encouraged our uh, redeployment or withdrawal from Lebanon in 2000, and Hamas killed the biggest number of Jews and Israelis since 1860. Uh, that's the date Israel now starts counting the people we lost in the Arab-Israeli conflict. So they offer a model of resistance and power and effectiveness in resisting Israel. Uh, I think that's their appeal. And you rightly point that these other regimes next to us, which are not, not very democratic, they are afraid that instability, uh, that the support of the street will turn against them, as it happened in Egypt against King Farouk when he did not deal with us well, against Nasser when he lost the Six-Day War, against Sadat that was murdered when he did peace with us. Um, so if I have to guess, uh, President Assisi of Egypt and King Abdallah of Jordan are very, very worried uh, these days because of this gap you're describing between the popular sentiment and the elite considerations. Very good, very good, very helpful, thank you. Um, future, future of Gaza. Before we talk about the future of the region, um, Netanyahu has now hinted for the first time in the last 24 hours that Israel may intend a uh, more permanent presence uh, in Gaza. Uh, that's one option. A return to the status quo. Um, our colleague uh, David Patel in the q and is, is asking whether that's the most uh, reasonable outcome. Um, option three, uh, the Palestinian Authority has some role in Gaza as it did before it was overthrown by Hamas. 
Uh, is one of these scenarios uh, becoming more likely in your mind? So I think the most, at least initially when Israel moved in, although there was not full planning for the next stage, um, the idea was dismantle Hamas somehow, then transfer it to some international entity, uh, and then allow the PA to run the area. Um, legally, by the way, Gaza is part of the state of Palestine. It's a state that's, although it's not fully dependent, it's recognized by many countries in the world as a state. And, and even now, some of the civil servants in Gaza are paid by the PA in the West Bank. So that's the easiest thing because they're already, in terms of international law, that's Gaza is part of, uh, of Palestine. Challenges are Palestinian Authority is corrupt, inefficient, doesn't have support in the West Bank. Secondly, it cannot be seen as coming on, uh, on the uh, heels of Israeli bayonets. Um, so a lot of ideas were floating around. What I think Netanyahu is referring to, again, we have no details beyond the statements you mentioned, is having some sort of a civilian uh, or some governance, self-governance governance of Palestinians, but in a way that Israel will still be able to take care of its security needs. I, maybe like Area B, for those of us who know that in the West Bank, where the Palestinians run their day-to-day -day life, but Israel essentially has a freedom of action uh, for security. If that's achievable or not, uh, I don't know. Um, and there could be creative ideas. For example, if you follow what happened in Kosovo, you can have multiple sovereignties. So you'll have one component will be by the Palestinians, one by some international Arab force, maybe a UN force. But if I have to guess, that would be the ideal structure, what I described uh, in the eyes of Israel. It, it's it's hard to imagine uh, any Arab uh, country or coalition of Arab countries who would take that task on, uh, let alone the United States or the European Union uh, volunteering to um, to provide security measures or stability in Gaza. It would seem like a very difficult task. If, yes, but we have precedents from the world and even in the Arab world. In 1976, during this, the first stages of the Lebanese civil war, the Arab League had a, a force, the Arab Intervention Force, was comprised mostly of the Syrian military and later on turned to the Syrian occupation. It became the Syrian occupation of Lebanon. But there was a framework of the Arab League. And look, all the choices here are not great, not for us and not for our neighbors. If Egypt will think that it's going to be politically destabilized from an ongoing conflict, maybe it will be more motivated to send a peacekeeping force, for example. We have other examples in Africa and the West African Union, whatever it's called. It's a regional organization in Western Africa in which the countries uh, intervene in troubled countries. So we have examples from the global south, from the Arab world of these things happening. But I agree with you. This is huge political risk. Also, personally, I'm not sure it's so great for Israel to have, you know, uh, tanks potentially from countries we don't have diplomatic relations 70 kilometers from Tel Aviv. But it's all, all if you think in clear analytical terms, all, almost all the choices are bad and you can come up with a lot of reasons why they're not good. This is going to be a choice between a set of bad choices. And presumably, if the Palestinian Authority is to take over some responsibility in Gaza, it would have to be offered something in return, uh, presumably a, a substantive move towards statehood. Yeah, so that's the price they already named. Uh, President uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, Abu Mazen mentioned that. Be very difficult to do with the current government. This will entail a change of government in Israel, which can be either as a result of this thing, what you're describing, or because of the internal challenges that Netanyahu uh, 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 is facing. Um, do you foresee uh, do you foresee a growing instability in the West Bank as this drags on and on? Yes, we're already seeing it. I mean, there's greater violence in the West Bank. Uh, for now, it's contained. I mean, there are unfortunately casualties, uh, mostly Palestinian. But the, the longer this uh, continues, there'll be, you know, their relatives, uh, sense of peoplehood uh, and so on. Palestinian Authority is, very, is behaving generally very responsibly, trying to contain this. Uh, but there, it, the longer this drags on, the greater the risks are for regional actors. But the irony is, if you stop now and don't defeat Hamas, also big risks for uh, uh, not only for us, but for uh, actors in the region, even the Palestinian national movement. 
you know, it offers two visions. If the more aggressive combative vision wins, this may mean a, a worse thing of Hamas in the West Bank. Um, that is that is one of many things about this conflict that protesters around the world uh, do not seem to understand. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, my my impression is many Israelis are uh, baffled uh, and depressed by uh, a, a large protest movement that seems to oppose any Israeli effort to move civilians away from the fighting zone, uh, seems to oppose Israeli efforts to eliminate Hamas, as if Hamas were a positive element, um, that opposes support for more moderate elements or any constructive future solution. Uh, international pressure seems to be in favor of unilateral surrender by Israel. So first of all, we, you know, the important international actors on the leadership level seem to support Israel. You had in the first week of the war, we had your President Biden uh, and a whole host of other uh, leaders, Rishi Sunak from the United Kingdom, the Dutch Prime Minister, Macron was supposed to come. I can't even remember if he came. It was he did, he did. The German time. Chancellor did, yeah. Yeah, so we had the commander of the German Air Force today was here and was donating blood in Sheba Hospital, which also is unfathomable 75 years after the Holocaust. Uh, the commander of the continuation of the Luftwaffe is coming to show his... Uh, is uh, support for Israel. So I would separate the more calculated political actors and leaders and the responsible uh, 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 you know, Western European American leadership. I think the Israeli frustration to go back to your question is a few levels. First of all, I think people here are baffled by the use of a post-colonial indigenous people a model that is reflecting maybe of America's uh, history on our uh, conflict. So this idea that Israelis are settler colonial that showed up here 120 years ago and displaced the indigenous people. So you're using frames that were developed in a different context for here. Uh, and of course, we see it very differently. There was you know, Jewish sovereignty here 2,000 years ago. There's ongoing Jewish presence in the world. There was a, Jew there was a 2,000 year old Jewish um, synagogue in Gaza. There was a Jewish community in Gaza until 1936. Um, one of uh, Israel's uh, uh, Jewish history is most challenging figures, uh, the false messiah of the 17th or 18th century, Shabtai Tzvi, his main decipher was Nathan from Gaza. So we is, we find it hard to understand why we, we are seen in this specific post-colonial discourse, whereas the situation here is much more complicated. You know, we had pa proto-Palestinian leaders inviting Jews to come here in the 18th century, Dair al-Omar. So, so that's one issue, just implying this in a way that's, it's again, if you will, Western uh, um, uh, superiority in the sense that we, we are now guilty for something we did in the colonial and imperial project. And now we are going to employ this lens even on other situations. So that's one element of bafflement. Secondly, and I can understand it because you, know, you and me work in the world of ideas where people strive for the ultimate justice. So I think some of it is the, the desire of people in the 20s to see ultimate justice. And sometimes on the way to heaven and justice, there's horrible things. I think of the intellectuals that supported the Iranian revolution. You know, the Shah was corrupt, so we we'll support whoever replaces him. And of course, you came, we came in a regime that's much more worse for women, for gays, for, uh, and so on. So in this striving, which I understand, I was also an idealistic 20 year old to achieve ultimate justice, you lose nuance, and sometimes you end up with a disaster that is 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 far greater. Um, that, that's my, I think, my intuitive response. I should also say we are very focused here on our current, on the sirens, on the funerals. It's not that people constantly think what's happening in Colombia and Berkeley. It's on people's minds and there's disappointment because many of us, like myself, were trained in these institutions. In a way, it's sort of our home, uh, home away from home. And so even people who are left-wing, who are progressive, who are very active, who are, who are disappointed from this uh, lack of uh, nuance and complexity, while we try to maintain our humanity and still, despite this horror, sympathize with the people in Gaza who are suffering. So life is complex, nuance has a lot of gray, and it's very frustrating when people you expect to see this nuance and granularity they fail to see that. 
Thank you for a, a wonderful closing statement. Uh, there are about 25 more questions in the Q&A that I, I could have asked. I, I will send them to you. Um, I, I thank you for your time, especially given the fact that it is now past 11 o'clock at night um, on, on, the, on the coast of Israel. Um, uh, thank you, Udi. Uh, thanks for hanging in there, and thanks for thanks for asking, uh, answering uh, tough questions, and uh, thank you all for for joining this conversation today and for supporting our institute uh, these uh, past twelve years. If you are keen to hear about uh, the events uh, that we are offering uh, at least once or twice a week, uh, you can find those on our website as well as recordings uh, of past events. Uh, we thank you for your support. Uh, we wish uh, we wish for peace in the Middle East, um, and we hope to see you soon uh, at a future event. Well, I'll just add my thanks to Ron for inviting me, for, to Rebecca and Alexa for their work behind the scenes that made this uh, uh, so professional. I want to thank the 104 people that are still with us for taking the time to think of a troubling situation, and may we all have good news. Thank you very much. Thank you, Udi. Have a have a good night. Thank you.